Hey everybody, Jeff here, and welcome back to the channel as we continue our analysis of the condo collapse of the Champlain Tower South condominium in Surfside, Florida, down near Miami Beach. In today's video, I'm going to present to you four possible engineering design changes that I think could have saved the condominium from collapsing in the first place. So as the city of Surfside has made all of these building permits and records and floor plans available to us, since the condo collapsed, we've been up till 3 a.m. almost every night analyzing and looking at floor plans, finding flaws, and coming up with solutions that we think might have helped this design from the get-go. Okay, for once today, folks, I'm putting that bonus material first because I have been trying since the first week in July to slip this into one of my videos, but the videos were getting too long, so I had to keep, well, I'll do it in the next one. I'll do it in the next one. Today, I want to talk to you about that Toyota Supra also, so I want to mention that first. And this has been a big item for us since day one because, you know, once you get past, you know, the death of, you know, all of the people and everything. The other thing that a lot of people lamented over when they saw this picture was people were going, Jeff, man, is that a Toyota Supra? And I'm like, yeah, it sure is. And this sort of su somewhat survived a little bit in the garage. And so we were trying to figure out where this was. But we got some clues because when you look in the back behind here, what's really happened, this, we're, we're on the west side of the property facing due east, and these are the dumpsters right above it that have fallen straight down almost, I don't know if they're on top of the car or what, but look, it jammed this pipe right here. So we can finally assign this car its legitimate parking spot now. And the reason why we couldn't before was we were using this along with another video that we had from the Miami-Dade Fire Department. And let me show you a problem here with the parking map. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but the problem is we is that if you see, he's got errors too, folks. Every engineer makes mistakes. This map is showing 114, 114, 114. See, he's got 114 like five or six times. He's got 122 three times. So this map was inaccurate from day one. What it should have been is this is 114, 15, 16, 17, 18. 118 right here. And so I knew from the fire department video that this spot right here was 118 because one of these poles had the number on it right here. So therefore, we know that the super was parked right here in space number 95. And this column right here is space number 96. Now the Supra is sitting right here at this moment in time. There's the two dumpsters. They came crashing through the lobby floor level right onto the car and there's the red pipe but as you can see we think this is space number 96 as we go frame by frame you can sort of see it right there but we'll show you in a second what really uh, points it out to us as to where it is so here you can see the dumpsters are sticking out but as you come over to here watch this column right here where i'm pointing you're going to see space number 118, I believe, as we go around this guy's helmet. Let me see. Yeah, see right there. So that is the column for space number 118. So now as we come back around here, you can see what they were working on. They were trying to get at something back up in there. So when you're standing here on Collins Avenue at the front of the building, this is where the dumpster goes right in here. And I believe there's a couple of them in there. See, they just rolled them right in there. So they fell down, so the car was probably somewhere around here. So here as we look at the lobby level floor plan and we zoom in, so here's all the trash area. This is where the dumpsters get rolled in right here. And this is in line with, of course, with the elevators. And we know the car was parked somewhere around here. So if you remember back in July when I showed you this slide here of 
what it would look like with the deck collapsing and everything. I just kind of showed you just a, a gross overview, but you can see how the pool deck is sort of a continuous slab with a one foot six inch difference. It's a step up. Um, and this is not anatomically correct. I just kind of drew it real quick, but look what happens if the pool deck collapses and it wants to shear down this particular column and maybe pull it away and tear it down. This is the one that was missing in the tourist video right here. Then that's what could possibly, because it's yanking on all of the other beams and everything, pull down this column here, which would start the whole process going. Architectural and engineering change number one. Add an expansion joint or an isolation seam that would make the pool deck separate from the building where they're not touching and they're not connected to do something like this. Okay, so I'm going to zoom us in a little bit and look and just kind of pay attention to this a little bit. What I'm gonna show you here is what I think they could have done to prevent this from happening. So here's the overview. Now watch what's gonna happen right here where the two come together here by the building. You see that, that little subtle change that just happened right there? Watch, I'll show you again. See how they're connected now? And now we're going to disconnect them. Okay, but you can't just leave it like that. You have to add this, an extra column there over that end. So let me zoom in here and show you what we're doing. You're basically isolating the two so that if the pool deck falls down, it won't pull the rest of the building with it. It's very simple. This is nothing groundbreaking or, or new here. They've employed these techniques for years. And in fact, when we stayed at the Fort Lauderdale Marriott Harbor Beach Resort last month, we saw this exact same thing here in their parking garage. Here is an expansion joint. See how there's a couple of inches space there and a column on each part of it there to support it. So this is very common in garages and in other structures when you need to isolate two parts of the building. Okay, so take a look at this right here. This is one method of implementing it up top. So this is what it looks like top side when you go up above the garage and then outside on the back patio. So this is all facing the beach. Trend. Start. Okay, then over here we have this other transition, which looks like it keeps going all the way down to the end of the wall there, right at the ocean. Okay, so right here along the deck, I believe this might be an isolation seam because you can see it runs all the way down to the end there. So what made sense at the time to the architect and the engineers is that you have this pool deck, the entire slab of the pool deck, continues on and it becomes one with the first floor of the building. So it kind of makes sense, right? Safety in numbers. So you have this big, huge slab of concrete that is now acting to keep everything solid and connected together. But what happens when that web of concrete now just becomes useless or becomes weak? And did they ever think about a punching shear, which is common in garages? So what they thought was the strength of their design actually became the Achilles heel of their design when it all falls apart. So here's a challenge I have to all of you architects and engineers out there. When you're designing something, it's easy to design it for when it works. Anybody can design a slab that works until all of a sudden, what happens when the concrete fails? What happens when somebody does something really stupid? I can design a radio or a cell phone or a mobile radio for the car and the circuit works great. What happens when somebody hooks up third party accessories? that all of a sudden cause problems or short circuits. You can't just say, well, that voids the warranty. They're not supposed to do that. My question to you is what can you do to your design to make it more robust to withstand stupidity? That's the thing people don't take into account in their designs is stupidity or neglect of the owner or abuse. Architectural engineering change number two, add drop panels to the ceilings at every column. Now, in my opinion, in all garages, this should be the norm anyway, because it gives you an extra thick pad of concrete to help resist punching shear. And again, while I was at the Fort Lauderdale Marriott Harbor Beach Resort, we saw in their garage that they also made great use of these drop panels. So here's your standard column going straight up to the ceiling here. And instead of doing what they did at the Champlain Towers, what they did here at the Harbor Beach Marriott was they added these drop panels along the top. So this looks like about maybe six inches or so of, 
extra concrete slab that they form. And what this does is this gives you extra strength against punching shear. So it's possible that just the addition of these onto some of the columns under the pool deck could have prevented the pool deck from ever collapsing. Because when you have a punching shear, the angle wants to go off like that and like that. When it shears off, it creates almost like a... It looks like a cell phone tower, <laughs> I guess you could call it when it's cut off, or a mushroom head. But that's where having this extra pad, this drop panel of concrete formed around it here, will provide you with that extra strength. It's commonly done in garages, and I'm frankly surprised that they did not implement this at the Champlain Towers. Now, as you look around the rest of the garage, you can see all of the columns have it. And they've also got the protection on the corners, I don't know how much good this does, but it certainly prevents the corners of these columns from getting chipped. And just in case you think you really don't need it, remember the rebar is only set in maybe an inch to three inches inside that corner. So yes, a car coming in at maybe five miles an hour, somebody's drunk, not paying attention, boom. Sure, you could probably take a little chunk off of there. So Champlain Towers didn't have these on there, but I don't think that's a deal breaker. That's not going to cause the building to collapse along and look at some of the other ones see so you have a lot more bolstered strength I, I think here and only that you see how you got these metal the Champlain towers they didn't have these on their columns there but they have them here see the metal guards and those are good to have because you know I don't think a car could ever cause a problem now we've seen reports that have said that it would take a car hitting a column at 40 or so miles per hour maybe even more the column wins every time the structure of the columns here with the drop panel is what really adds to the beefing up. And here you can see they had it all over the garage. Here's more examples of it over here, all over the place in the garage. Architectural and engineering change number three, adding capitals to the top of our columns. Again, this is something that I've always felt should just be automatic in every garage. A capital is a widening of the column up at the top, and this widening of the column also helps protect us against punching shear. Now, when you think of capitals on columns, you think of the old Greek style of columns that had like your Doric, your Ionic, your Corinthian caps. Uh, but today, these are actually much more functional and are geared specifically to protect you and give you more strength to the tops of these columns. So this right here is from ConcreteConstruction.net, and I'll put a link to their article in the video description down below. So this happened back in, I guess, around 2016 or so, and this garage was built improperly by the contractor, even though it had been designed properly. They just didn't implement it properly. So there was a number of things that were done wrong, and so they had to come in and shore it up. So let's take a look at what they did. And so this right here is is one of the repairs that they can do and actually this i think should be done by design in all garages with the columns anyway i mean how much more extra work is it to do this with the rebar so instead of your column coming straight up into the flat slab right there you can see they make it wider by putting this capital here so by making this wider cap it makes it much more resilient to punching shear so you have two different devices here that are opposing the forces of the punching shear so with this rebar up here that's the form for your drop panel so they're going to build a drop panel right here these are the modifications they had to make to these columns they just drill some holes here you put some rebar here you start building the form Okay, so by the time you get to the next step, this is what you're looking at here. So they've got it all framed up. They've got the wood in place. They're ready to do the pour. Everything's all shored up. And then here's what your final product looks like here. So you see how they've just put these nice wide caps up here? This alone probably would have prevented some of that punching shear that we saw. So you can see here what they did with these drop panels. These are even much thicker. These are much thicker than the drop panels we saw at the... Harbor Beach Resort when I showed you that one earlier. These columns here look to either be 20 or 24 inches wide. And then you compare that to these columns at the Champlain Tower South before the building collapsed. These were 16 by 16 columns. And remember, all of these over here were underneath a 12-story building. And they're even skinnier once you get out from underneath the building, underneath the pool deck. So as we see in this still shot here from Fiorella's now famous garage video, remember these are 12 by 16s 
once you get outside the southern edge of the building. Very simple, folks. Make the columns wider. Now, we all saw what happened in the part of the Champlain Tower South condominium that remained standing after the collapse. It was still there, right? What did it have? What was different about it? And I pointed this out to you in early July on one of our videos. That part of the building had 24-inch columns, folks. The part of the building that collapsed had 16-inch columns, which I think are a little bit too narrow. I'm thinking 20 to 24 inches is a lot better. And the part of the pool deck that's outside the building where there's just pool deck, those columns were only 12 inches by 16 inches. But in my opinion, you can forget about the 16 inch side of that dimension. Because if you have any forces going in the wrong direction, shearing through that 12 inches, that really means you've only got a 12 inch column, folks. Hey, so I have a question for you. What would you have done? What architectural or engineering change would you have implemented in order to prevent this condo from collapsing? Let us know down in the comments below. I always like to hear other ideas from other people. And if you're finding this video useful so far, hey, do us a favor, would you please? Give us a thumbs up down below. That tells us that you like us. Hey, let me tell you something. If you haven't subscribed to this channel yet and turned on the alerts, man, you can see all of the great videos you're missing. You see all of the great tour reviews you're missing too. So make sure you do that before you forget. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks, and we will see you on the next one.